Welcome to the Epigenomics Lecture of MCB 182. Please don't distribute the materials. So the learning objectives for today's lecture are basically to understand the uh, multiple definitions of epigenetics, uh, really be familiar with the different kinds of common marks uh, that are used to indicate enhancers, promoters, or transcribed regions. It's important to understand how hidden Markov models are used to find frequently used combinations of uh, epigenetic marks, mainly because, as you'll see in this lecture, a lot of histone modifications and even uh, DNA methylation is very context dependent in terms of its effects on gene regulation. And so a large part of uh, the challenge of epigenomics is really in understanding how the cell recognizes the different modifications within different contexts and how that then impacts gene regulation. It's important to understand the role of CPG uh, dinucleotide methylation in particular, as well as DNA accessibility. And so as we'll see in a few moments, DNA accessibility on its own is not really considered an epigenetic mark, but it plays such a central role in terms of uh, working with epigenetic uh, marks in order to impact gene regulation that we included as part of this lecture. In terms of the actual mechanics of uh, looking at epigenomic data, it's important to understand the basic measures uh, of histone modification chip seek quality control. And so uh, basically we'll discuss later on in the lecture um, what types of QC you typically have to do with, for example, chip seek data. It's really important to understand what the concept of multiple hypothesis testing is, why you need to care about it, and how you correct for multiple hypothesis testing. And it's important to understand the broad differences between uh, what is known as irreproducible discovery rate and false discovery rate, which are two concepts related to multiple hypothesis testing. So the study of epigenetics is really concerned with the question of, are we more than just the genome? And so we spent much of this course so far talking about DNA sequencing and its, its various applications, uh, but we haven't really talked about how the genome is used in conjunction with, for example, environmental cues. And so epigenetics, at least in the context of this lecture, is really kind of concerned with two questions. One of which is uh, what information gets passed between parents to their descendants. And so this question of uh, transgenerational uh, inheritance of information can really be studied at multiple levels. So you can think about the question of what information gets passed between, say, parent cells and daughter cells. Or you can think about how information gets passed between whole individuals um, when different individuals mate and produce progeny. Epigenetics is also used to study the question of how does how do genetic elements, how do different parts of the genome uh, work with and basically respond to different environmental cues. Uh, and so epigenetics here in that in that standpoint is concerned with you know, what are the mechanisms that the cell can use to integrate information from both uh, DNA and environmental cues in order to do something like change gene regulation. And so the term epigenetics was coined by Conrad Waddington back in 1942. And so at the time that he came up with this term epigenetics, uh, it was interesting because there were basically two competing hypotheses on how development happens. So there's one camp of people who push the idea of preformation, which is the idea that uh, an embryo basically initially contains an, a whole complement of uh, adult cells that are necessary to eventually develop into a full adult. And basically, uh, development really consists of just getting the right timing as to when to allow certain types of cells to grow and um, and basically unfold. Whereas the other camp of people were pushing the idea of epigenesis, which is the idea that uh, new tissues arise basically from successive interactions between different parts of uh, the initial embryo. And so uh, Waddington basically didn't think that these two competing camps were uh, mutually exclusive. He thought that um, 
he could build a a model that could incorporate both ideas. And so the the model that he came up with is what's known as the epigenetic landscape, uh, which was his model of how cells basically decide decide their fate. And so his idea was that uh, you could basically represent what amounts to like a pluripotent cell is basically a marble that rolls down this hill that I'm showing you on this slide here. And so the idea is that um, the different values that you see in this diagram represent um, barriers to switching cell fate decision once you've committed to something. And so the idea is that as this marble rolls down the hill, um, different kinds of like cues or environmental interactions might push or help uh, push the ball down one side or another uh, down this valley. And basically when a cell or the marble hits these uh, bifurcations in the uh, in the valley, that corresponds to that particular cell making a decision as to um, one particular cell fate or another. And you, you know, marble might hit multiple bifurcations before it gets to the end of the valley. And so the idea is that once the marble hits the bottom of the valley, then it's basically made its final decision about uh, cell fate and therefore it um, its decision is essentially irreversible. And so today, you know, obviously our ideas about development and uh, pluripotency and differentiation have matured a lot since then. And we've, uh, as we have as a community have revised the idea of the epigenetic landscape to incorporate more modern ideas about development. But uh, this epigenetic landscape picture is, is pretty pivotal in the field um, and is really what kind of started this, started this whole area. And so before we really get started, it's worth pointing out that uh, epigenetics is a pretty broad term and it's actually used to encompass kind of multiple lines of, um, of study of biological systems. And so uh, the first so-called definition of epigenetics uh, could be something like the study of mediators of uh, genetic, cellular, and environmental interactions uh, that basically work together to essentially produce different types of phenotypes. So these, these would include things like uh, gene by environment interactions and things like this. And so this particular definition of epigenetics doesn't really concern itself so much with whether those changes are heritable uh, as they, as it really focuses on just mechanisms for inter for integrating information from the, both the genome and the environment. Uh, whereas the second definition of epigenetics is really concerned with uh, heritable uh, changes in gene regulation and gene expression uh, that involve changes that are not due, that are not um, directly related to the DNA sequence itself. And so here in this lecture, we're primarily concerned with uh, epigenetics as it relates to uh, the basically the use of heritable but reversible uh, phenotypic changes to a chromosome that a cell can use to impact gene regulation that don't necessarily that don't involve uh, changes to primary DNA sequence. And so it's worth pointing out that in this lecture, uh, as is pretty common uh, elsewhere, um, we we look at a lot of histone modifications and their effects on gene regulation. Uh, but there's a lot of people who actually disagree with the use of the term epigenetics to refer to histone modifications because it's not entirely clear yet. So it hasn't been proven that, for example, all or even most of these histone modifications are actually heritable. So they may not be systematically and consistently uh, passed on from parent to progeny. And so it's, it's just worth remembering that uh, some people don't think of histone modifications as is kind of like a pure study of epigenetics. And so epigenomics, which is technically the title of this lecture, is really about the comprehensive study of different types of epigenetic modifications, how they're used in the cell and how uh, these modifications are used to control gene regulation and how they co-vary with uh, other types of gene regulation uh, as we look across different cellular contexts and um, and different types of tissues and development and so on. And so some classic processes that involve epigenetics include uh, processes like imprinting, which 
uh, in the case of humans, uh, involves the idea of uh, gene expression patterns or gene regulation patterns that we inherit from one particular parent or another, um, which nece necessarily involves, uh, for example, shutting down uh, expression of a particular locus that came from the other parent. Um, other processes include things like X chromosome inactivation, uh, which, for example, only happens in females, and also cellular reprogramming, which uh, you know involves, for example, like reprogramming um, fibroblasts to like neurons, for example, and which usually necessitate a, kind of like a global remodeling of epigenetics uh, across the entire genome. So, in terms of the types of epigenetic features of the genome that we'll be looking at. Uh, this lecture is primarily concerned with DNA methylation and histone modifications. And so DNA methylation generally, um, more specifically, we are looking at CPG dinucleotide methylation. Um, and so that's really just the addition of the methyl group uh, to CPG dinucleotides. And of course, DNA methylation is generally associated with silencing of genes because usually people think about uh, methylation of CPGs in CPG islands. Um, that said, CPG dinucleotide methylation is not always associated with silencing. In particular, methylation of gene bodies uh, doesn't always necessarily correlate with silencing of expression of that gene, uh, but we'll get to that later. Uh, in terms of histone modifications, histone modifications are really just post-translational modifications uh, to the tails of histone proteins. So of course, just as a reminder, uh, the genome doesn't exist as a sort of as naked DNA in the nucleus. Uh, at the kind of most basic level of organization, uh, DNA gets wrapped around groups of histones to form nucleosomes, for, uh, for example. And so, uh, in those nucleosomes, the tails of the histone proteins can get modified, and those modifications then in turn influence gene gene regulation. Um, it's worth pointing out that, again, that both DNA methylation and histone modifications are essentially context dependent. And so they can have the same modification can have different kind of activating or repressing effects, depending on uh, what else is happening around the genome in the, in the local area. Uh, and a few other points worth briefly mentioning are that uh, both DNA methylation and histone modifications uh, are essentially taking systems that are used through like all the mammals and you know much of the eukaryotes um, those are you know they're really critical for development uh, and their modifications are oftentimes uh, strongly associated with different types of diseases so as you'd expect most genomes encode entire families of enzymes uh, that are able to either add or remove different epigenetic marks from the genome and so enzymes that are generally involved in adding different epigenetic marks, like uh, acetyl groups or methyl groups, are termed acetyl transferases or methyl transferases. Uh, whereas those enzymes responsible for removing those tags are generally called things like decetylases or demethylases. In terms of the you know, machinery that is involved in reading and using those epigenetic tags to do things, um, readers, are gen readers generally refer to any part of the cellular machinery that basically recognizes these epigenetic tags and change their behavior based on the presence of those tags. So that obviously includes gene regulation, like the entire gene regulatory system, uh, chromatin organizers like CTCF, uh, and even DNA, even things like DNA replication machinery. Because as I mentioned before, um, some of these epigenetic marks like DNA methylation are heritable and so that means that they get passed between parent and progeny and so obviously to get passed on uh, they need to be able to be read and recognized during DNA replication. So I also want to point out that especially for a select few set of marks it's generally well known um, what the final effect of these epigenetic marks are on gene regulation. So for example um, HDK27 acetylation is, is well known to be associated with strong enhancers. Uh, but what isn't as well known is how those epigenetic marks actually functionally drive those changes in gene regulation. Uh, 
Um, so for example, some histone modifications work by changing, making small changes to chromatin structure. So for example, like acetylations of uh, lysine residues can basically neutralize their positive charge and basically ultimately lead to the, like less strong binding between histones and, um, and the DNA that's wrapped around them. And what that does is it essentially makes that particular DNA wrapped around uh, that histone more accessible to regulatory proteins and transcription factors. They can then see their binding sites and bind to them. Uh, similarly, how DNA methylation actually gets read and influence gene regulation also uh, is not completely known. And so, for example, uh, it is known that there are what are known as methyl binding domains, uh, which are basically protein domains that can, can basically read or see uh, methylated CPG dinucleotides. And what some of these MBDs do is they essentially recruit chromatin remodelers and histone deacetylases and methylases that then can basically recognize methylated DNA and then they change histone modifications near them, which then leads to some other cascade of events that ultimately shuts down expression into particular locus.